So uh, <clears throat> today our second speaker will be uh, Associated Professor Tolga Uyar from the uh, Nevşehir Hacı Bektaş Veli University located in Cappadocia. His research is mainly focuses on uh, Byzantine art and archaeology with emphasis on the monumental painting of Cappadocia. He has been a member of several field surveys and excavations in Turkey. And his paper will be, Kilroy was there. <coughs> yes. Crusaders in Cappadocia, textual and visual evidence. Yes, Tolga, the floor is yours, please go on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I will be speaking Turkish, so I'm in the German channel, and I think that's okay. In popular American visual culture, one of the best examples is Kilroy was here, and it originates to 1930s and especially after the Second World War. And in a unique way, Kilroy was popular in an unprecedented manner. And almost all units in the US armies, they indicated they were here by these words. It was an image and also graffiti saying Kilroy was here. In fact, we see the example of Kilroy in region Richard Dawkins, biologist from the UK, we see as man. Dawkins defined it from meme, which means implication and imitating. The, gen the genes are transforming from one body to the other and they are multiplying in the pool of genes and means are also multiplying in the same way in the context of sociology. In a larger sense, they mean imitation, but it can also be identified through interaction. From one brain to the other, they jump and they multiply themselves and they travel across cultures. In this sense, thoughts and slogans, in addition to that, clothes and other material cultural elements are also transformed from generation to generation. Visual arts are also perfect examples of memes. And during the Middle Ages in Byzantium, there were the evidences of existence of foreign cultures, physical and abstract evidences are present. And there are similar popular graffitis and wall writings, as we can see. This is from Istanbul, Hagia Sophia. Viking graffiti in quote, quotations. In addition to that, we have other examples in the history of Byzantine and especially from time to time at the center of the empire. We see other evidences, especially in Cappadocia. For example, here we see a series of mystical graffitis in Arabic letters. And in addition to that, we see the drawings. And this shows that they were from the immediate invasions of Arabs, which date back uh, to ninth century. Of course, for now, this is only an argument, a claim, and there is a need for researching this topic in more detail. In addition to that, when we look at written histories, primary sources, there are certain comprehensive references to the existence of crusaders in Cappadocia. After the mid 11th century, the region was out of the control of the Byzantium Empire, and there were new political actors in the geography, and together with that, contemporary developments took place. And yesterday, we saw certain maps, and this map, these maps are similar to yesterday's maps. In the left-hand side at the top, we see the first crusade, and we see that it is just at the heart of Cappadocia. And in the second map, we see that 
we see after Malaz Girt, this important Byzantine state was shortly transformed. And this map also shows this transformation. Yes, these new actors entering into the geography, Armenian princedoms or states, we can say, Anatolian Seljuks, Danishmandits, and other early Anatolian princedoms, and mostly independent or more correctly, vigilance and nomad Turkic groups. In addition, in fact, we can say that the North European mercenaries and their behaviors in Constantinople uh, in, to, in the ninth century can also be observed in Anatolia and the mid in the Anatolia and the medieval crusaders' behaviors. We could see their behaviors and traces as well. However, as far as I know, there is not any research about these traces. For that reason, to, in today's presentation, I would like to talk the military culture of crusaders, but instead of their direct traces, I would like to understand and share their indirect witnesses. And this chase started in the 13th century Cappadocia, and this topic is rarely known, and this hasn't attracted the attention of experts, and some of its dimensions are not yet known. There are a few post-Byzantium wall paintings, and there are copies or rep repetitions of sociocultural theories that I just mentioned. And based on this theory, we can interpret these traces. And my purpose in general sense is to understand the relationship between cultural existence and artists, especially in late medieval age and to see this perspective from methodological methods based on written histories and where, is, where, and where there is not written history, visual sources will help us and they can inform us as much as written cultures. Andrew Peacock, Andrew Peacock delivered this issue yesterday in his perfect presentation. But before everything, I would like to discuss the history of visual materials. And from this perspective, we have to define what this historical context is and how should we interpret this historical context. And we can understand it from the geography of Cappadocia. There are a few written histories, and this introduction part is a bit boring because I received it from uh, written sources, and for that I would like to apologize in advance. From Malazgirt, only 10 years after Malazgirt, we look at the existence of the Turkish in Cappadocia, and we see the conquest process. And interestingly, it was fast and very easy. In 10 years, the region was taken under control completely, we can say. It was out of the Byzantine control in nearly 10 years. And especially throughout the history of the Byzantine, we see, the e we see at the eastern border of this region, the core was the Byzantine for defense. And we can say that this control changing hands in such a short time is very surprising. And exactly at this point in 1081, the Pechenek and the Norman threat was present in the West and the Emperor Alexis Komeros I withdrew, withdrew all the military existence in Anatolia. And there was also Iran, uh, Iranian and threat and also the Seljuk Medikcha. Konya, Aksaray, Kayseri, they were also showing their presence. And in Iznik, Suleyman Shah took the Sultanate. And this privilege was given to Suleyman Shah. After this privilege was taken, a Bulgazi Hassan Bey took the same kind of privilege. 
by being appointed as the governor of Kayseri or Cappadocia. And we see the Selçuk's of Rome took the control of Cappadocia, Byzantine Cappadocia by around 1080s. It is possible to say that they took political control. However, this control was weakened by the First Crusade, which was around at 1097. And this shows that the military existence was not sufficient. And it is not possible to pass this topic without referring to, uh, to this weakness. And we look at the evidences of the First Crusade, and it shows that the, the Cappadocia was ruined and Kayseri was also devastated. And during those years, Kayseri Emir Hassan, his city, Cappadocia, Shar city, uh, district, all these districts and towns, as well as immediate surrounding, were left by people, and we learn it from different sources. Indeed, between Crusaders and Turkish, the military struggle left in local memory in Cappadocia. For example, in 1097 in Aksaray, Ereli, uh, the Byzantine Heracleas or Cappadocia Heracleas, according to the sources, there was so violent conflict between Crusaders and Kalitya Arslan. Kai Sidi Meli Hassan shows, uh, showed that there was a lot of death, death toll for that reason. Uh, he referred to the volcano close to the skirts of the volcano. For that reason, the mountain started to be referred as Hassanda because of this withdrawal. And by the 1080s, uh, the plateau of central Anatolia and close to Black Sea region, Danish mandates, revealed as a new political power. And the punishment was also referred to as the only Turkish ruler referred together with the Selçuk Sultan, Melikshah. And together with Selçuks and Crusaders or other collaborations with Armenian states, he obtained a, a significant political power and also a source of balance. And even if partially, Danish mandates also took the control of the region of Cappadocia from time to time, even for a limited uh, uh, time. For example, a, a Syrian historian Mikhail shows that in 1085 or and 1086, Danish mandates took the control of Cappadocia and dominated Kai city. In real sense, uh, as of early dates, Sivas was a Danish mandate city. We can precisely use the claim. However, Assyrian Mikhail gives the reference to Kai City and being under control of Danish mandate. And it, there is another source which is focusing on the same period, but there is a contradiction between these two sources. According to the second source, it is a Byzantine historian Anna Komnene and the famous work Alexia, Sachukit Emir, Emir Hassan immediately before the First Crusade ruled the Kaiseri city. So this means that in this region there is a power struggle between Danish mandates and Seljuks. The control of Danishmans in Cappadocia was partial, and as of the end of the 11th century, it started and it gradually increased. And in 1134, Melik Danishmand made Kayseri the capital of Danishmand, and we see that the city was rebuilt in certain chronicles. In consequence, at the end of the 11th century and early 12th century in Byzantine Cappadocia in the region, there were certain powers, four powers, and we see the struggles for political power in this geography. These are Rum Salchuks, Danish mandates, Crusaders, 
and Armenian states, the neighboring Armenian states, we can say. I forgot to note it here, I apologize. And in sources, written sources about uh, Cappadocia, these are never mentioned, almost never mentioned. And these are after groups. And we see that these groups were always in interaction. There was a continuous relationship between them. They were uh, talking, uh, speaking uh, Greek, Greek Orthodox were speaking Greek, and they can be also qualified as the far grandchildren of the Byzantine, despite 150 years apart. And the other groups, they are nomadic Turkmen groups. And yesterday's presentation, Scott Radford also underlined that there are historic encounters between these four groups, but these encounters are not only consisting of a struggles or military conflicts. There is also sharing of commodities, goods, cultures, ideas, and social behaviors. There are deep interactions between these groups. In Cappadocia, we see the indirect traces of these interactions. However, only after the 13th century, Rum Salchukids eliminated their political competitors in Anatolia and they established a state and that's when these traces became evident. For 100 years, we can say for almost a century, there was not any arts production in the region. In consequence, we see social and economic welfare after the establishment of a central state by the Salchuks. And we see economic welfare as well. This economic welfare shows not only the cultural life flourishing in cities in Cappadocia, Christian and Orthodox societies also started to produce art in the geography of Cappadocia. We see the revival of arts in this region. And in the first half of 13th century in Cappadocia, the Salchukid subjects were Orthodox Christians and for tens of uh, church walls, they started to produce rich artistic monuments. And undoubtedly this shows the stable politics and economic welfare, as well as the bright and prolific cultural environment at that time. And in these wall paintings, we see the depictions of military saints, and we see the modern typologies of weaponry and arms as well. In the 12th and 13th century Anatolia, we see the spontaneously developing common visual language. And more correctly, as Scott Redford identified, we see the visual language of power, and we see that they have a rich vocabulary, and they are, according to my opinion, they are historic documents, because we see the military soldier saints, and uh, there are some poems of these um, graffitis and wall paintings, and we see that in church life, there is regular interaction between these soldiers. And we can say that these are images that identify their identities. And these images are also showing the different political, ethnic and religious backgrounds. And this is a common point of contact indeed. As I said earlier in my speech, this is a, a sort of sociocultural gene. For example, among these military equipment, Fly, fly kids, in quotations, we see the shape of the shields. And let's have a closer look at these shields so that we can understand the phenomenon better and more tangible. When we look at these pictures, we can see that they give some indication about the time and the place where they were produced and they are reflecting the collective memory in such a way that we see the flaky shape of shields and this form was also seen in the context of Latin Byzantine soldiers. It is a common form of shield used in this context and we look at this typology. In fact, this typology shows that Byzantine, Sarchukid and Ayubi armies are encountering with Byzantine there are certain claims as 
this regard. However, in such a short time, they turn into an image about a Latin identity, which is an undoubted fact, especially based on this shield form. And this shows, in fact, how the sociocultural genes uh, theory is a viral phenomenon. In a way, it can also be resembled to natural selection in the biological evolution theory. In social cultural uh, processes, we see similar mechanisms, in fact. We can say very, sp very fast dissemination and spreading. It is so fast that, according to one theory, East Islam or um, armies or this form was taken from Byzantine armies and they take it for themselves and we can accept it as that. And we see the 13th century wall paintings and I conducted a systematic research in this form of a shield, a shield and in Levant and Cilicia. We see examples and there are similarities not only in the form, but also on the ornament on top of these fields. And Scott Redford defined the visual representation of power or visual language of power. And we see this in military perspective. We can also see this, uh, see this as examples of how to read it on military equipment. We see the zigzag motifs on the common shields. And this is the first example Unfortunately, this is a wall painting that is not available anymore, unfortunately. This is originating from the mid-13th century. The other one is a very well-known church, in fact. However, this Kirktamalte church in Ihlara didn't much attraction by uh, experts in this area. Direk Nicole didn't act add this to analysis. Or in Tuxetli, the church, which is dating back to the 13th century, the common point of all these uh, shields is the zigzag motif. And looking at these shields, we see a simple zigzag motif. And indeed, we can say that it is actually a symbol for armies. And it is important to know what this means visually. And in fact, we listened to it uh, from Redford yesterday. In Salchukit stands and flags and banners, we see this symbol of power. And in fact, as he mentioned, this is even beyond the context of Salchuk. In Anatolia, in the 12th or 13th century, it is actually a viral motto about the common identity of Anatolia, central Anatolia. In Cappadocia, there is this painting program, which is not very well known, but in Ulaja, there is Bezirane Church from the late 13th century. And most probably, this was belonging to a Cappadocian Orthodox Christian, and this was associated with the cultural identity of the region. You see on white background, a red a zigzag, which is associated with the identity of the region. However, beyond the context of Salchuk and Cappadocia, uh, we see this in many other examples in the surrounding geography. And I would like to show you one which is very striking. In North Syria, this ceramic file was found, and this is the ceramic painting actually on it, here. It is naive cavalry picture. And it was found in North Syria, however, we see in Latin Jerusalem Kingdom, it was produced in the workshops. And this kingdom. And according to apotropaic beliefs, there is another visual motto, and this is actually shown on the Crusader shields. We see imaginary creations, and this is quite common as well in Greece and uh, Cilician Latin kingdoms. In sacred soils, we see a lot of creatures on shields. 
and we see these motifs quite common. And this is just an example which is far away, and I think it's interesting to match it by a tapestry that is very well known. And I want to show the example, the, the one in the right hand side, it is completely abstract. However, the visual reference is the same because on this field, we see this imaginary creature, a fantastic animal figure, a creature. And most probably it was a function of apotropoic in this image. And in the context of uh, Crusaders, we see the visual language, we see the forehead form, and most probably it is originating from Europe. And there is another motif, it is the Dama motif. And this is how I address it, the Czech board. And in St. Uh, Georgius, Church, we see the shield of Theodorus again. Another striking example, this motif is shown in the shield as well. In, it, it is produced in the 13th century in a workshop under the rule of Latin Kingdom. And we can say that there is similarity with this shield as well. Again, when we compare it with a faraway geography from Britain, 13th century, or the first quarter of the 13th century. It is black and white, unfortunately. It is in the right hand side on my screen. It's also quite similar with the wall painting. It is from the Church of St. Mary. Again, finally, from Cappadocia, these paintings are from Cappadocia and they date back to Cappadocia, close to the village of Uxigli. And we see the details of crucifixion I want to show you a detail. There is Roman legionnaire or centurion depiction, and he is holding an element which is an iconographic element, which is an inseparable part of the crucifixion. And we see this, case, and this also reminds mostly of the Italian crusader Scondottiere. And we, it is similar to 13th century shields because there are red tapes on it, as we can see in detail here. It is round shape and a small shield, actually. And as a result, we see military equipment. And when we evaluate their typology and morphology, in fact, they are still debatable as per their existence in 13th century Anatolia and also the surrounding regions. We see examples and interactions, uh, sort of. And most probably, we can distinguish in two important contexts. Uh, one is the Islamic context, and this includes Salchuks, Salchuks and Danish Mandis and other early period for instance, Ilhanids and Ayubis members. On the other hand, we can also distinguish Eastern Christianity context. And this includes Byzantium, Crusaders or Latins, and also Georgians, Armenians, so on and so forth. Among these, there is an incredible interaction, and we can say that the discussions are still going on. However, there is something that we know for sure. This permeability is quite notable, and we look at the military equipment, and in technical terms, this military equipment affected both parties. On battlefield, they were affected by each other in technical terms, but this effect is not limited to technical terms only. There is effect in symbolical and in image wise as well. And of course, we talked about all these military 
entities, and all these military entities have different ethnic groups and religious groups inside, and we can say that this is the reason why they affect each other. When we look at the Saljuk army, and there are different researches about Saljuk army as well, Andrew Peacock also mentioned the Crusaders army, and there were certain soldiers, 30,000 uh, mercenaries who ran away from the army and also they transferred to Saljuk army in Famphilia region. In, indeed, Saljuk armies remind us of a mosaic in religious and ethnic terms. This includes Turkmen and Arabs, Anatolian Roms, Orthodox, who were speaking, who were speaking Greek and Kipchaks, Armenians, Kurds and Latin and armies also had different ethnic groups, including Catholic groups. And when we look at Latin historical sources, in fact, there were mercenaries in Saltuk army and being mercenaries or paid soldiers in this army is way better than being a soldier in Memluk armies, for example. In that sense, we can say that Anatolia has a special place. In line with all this data, finally, the St. George's Church. I want to go back to this Church of St. Uh, George that I mentioned. And we see this painting. The Bani uh, painting. In fact, this painting is the corner store, uh, a cornerstone of this debate. Because in real sense, in Cappadocia, these paintings were paintings, in fact, show the interaction of different cultures and ethnic groups. And they also show the methods of this interaction between different groups. It is, a, it is an instrument that shows us great details. And in Cappadocia, with, if there was no such uh, room and orthodox groups, unfortunately, we wouldn't be able to have this data. And thank you for your patience. Thank you very much, Tonka. Thank you very much for, for providing us with such information because you provided us with a different perspective of the region Cappadocia. And of course, as of the 11th century, the Cappadocia region was also the transition point of Crusaders. However, we, the cultural encounters were not only with Byzantines and Crusaders, there were various encounters, as you mentioned. In Anatolia, there were very different ethnic groups in Anatolia, and this, also include, this is also included in the encounters. And their cultural encounter is also quite uh, evident here. And when we look at these encounters, we can say that they are reflected on arts, and this is started especially in the 13th century, and they became visible. Thank you very much for giving us this brilliant information.